After looking at the incredible opening 18 verses of John's Gospel last time, today we're going to be finishing off chapter 1 of John, and I called this section, What's in a Name? As we go through, it'll hopefully become clear to you why I called it that, as Jesus called some incredible, incredible names in this section. If you haven't already done so, I do encourage you to subscribe to this channel. You'll get notifications when I post the next videos and like this video, share it with others. And if you find it helpful, make a comment to keep the conversation going in the comment stream. Also, just take some time and read this passage for yourself just to familiarize yourself with what's going on. Put question marks for things that you're confused by or note down key repetition or things that jump out as important themes, spend some time praying and asking God to open your eyes so that you will see wonderful truths about Him and His Word. I'm going to highlight some of what I've seen. As I showed in the first two videos, uh, what we see in John is evidence, belief and life. And this is from John chapter 20. 30 to 31, where John tells us that Jesus did many other signs, evidence, which we see throughout this book. But these ones are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And in this section, evidence is one of the key um, areas out of these three that gets piled up because we see a whole lot of testimony and eyewitness reports. So testimony and then what different people saw. So firstly, it's evidence from John the Baptist in these verses. Then it's evidence from Jesus' first disciples. And then finally, some added evidence from Jesus himself. John transitions us through the story by showing us a few key days. And he does this the next day, the next day, the next day. So we see four key days in the early ministry of Jesus. And these days impacted a few of Jesus' followers in a massive, massive way. Now the spotlight is clearly on our Lord Jesus in this section. Uh, John himself says that he is this voice calling out in the wilderness, which we'll look out for in a moment. I am the voice. But it's making straight the paths for the Lord. And so what's in a name? Throughout this section, we see some key names being given to Jesus. So he is the Lord. He's the Lamb of God. He is God's chosen one. Again, the Lamb of God is called Rabbi. Andrew tells his brother Simon, we have found the Messiah, the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. We see people following Jesus. Philip says, we have found the one that Moses wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. And then Nathaniel says, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus calls himself the son of man. And then there is an allusion to another Old Testament story here, which we'll look at in a moment. So these titles are all showing us a very big picture of Jesus. And they are showing us that Jesus is the one that the whole Old Testament has been looking ahead to. When John says, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, these words come straight from Isaiah 40, verse 3. Isaiah starts with the word, Isaiah 40 at least, starts with the words, comfort, comfort my people. It's good news for God's people. And Isaiah is saying, he's the voice, but he's preparing the way for the Lord, which it means that the Lord is coming. The Lamb of God is a big theme in um, Old Testament history, seeing how God used uh, sacrificial lambs, but 
I think the key reference that John is alluding to is Isaiah again. 53, verse 7 and 10. And we'll see in John's later book um, how the Lamb of God is pictured in the book of Revelation. But right here, um, we are seeing how he is, Jesus is the, the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies. Again, when John calls him God's chosen one, it's another Isaiah reference. This time from Isaiah 42, 42, verse 1. This Isaiah reference also links in with uh, the Spirit coming and resting on Jesus, which we see in this section. Um, just in these couple of verses, we see uh, God the Son, the Chosen One, God the Holy Spirit, and John being told by God the Father who to look out for. So the Trinity is in action here. Um, and that the spirit resting on this man, on this chosen one, is also picked up in Isaiah 42 verse 1. Again, we've got this Lamb of God idea, so Isaiah 53. And then the Messiah here. If you go and read 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 to 14, that is the promise made to King David of the forever king who had come from his line, whose rule would be an everlasting rule. And this promised king became known as the awaited Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one who had come and save his people. So Andrew is saying, this promised one has come. John the Baptist is saying, this promised one has come. Another cross reference you can look at, again from Isaiah, is 9 verse 6 and 7. The coming anointed one, the great king, the saviour in the line of David. Then when Philip is called, he goes and finds Nathanael and he says, we have found the one Moses wrote about. Again, this is going even further back to Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 to 19, where God said that he would raise up a prophet like Moses and so God's people have been waiting for this one, the, the prophet, they called him. So here, this is also Deuteronomy 18 uh, that the, the Jews are referring to. And they're saying, are you this Deuteronomy 18 prophet? And John the Baptist says, no. John the Baptist wasn't, but Jesus was. And then in verse 49, we get Nathaniel saying, you are the son of God. So again, it's a 2 Samuel seven reference but even more explicitly it's a psalm 2 verse 7 so psalm 2 is all about the anointed king who was to come who would rule eternally and calling jesus the son of god is a reference to that the one they've been waiting for has come and then king of israel is another old testament prophecy from Zephaniah 3 verse 15. They were longing for this King of Israel. So we've got Son of God, King of Israel, the one they've been waiting for, the Messiah, God's chosen one, the Lamb of God, the Lord. Incredible titles getting attached to Jesus at this early stage in the gospel. And then, in verse 50 and 51 where we get Jesus' testimony, again the evidence is mounted even further with two further cross references. The one coming, the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So that angels ascending and descending would have made any Jew think about Genesis 28 where Jacob had a dream and he saw the stairway uh, to heaven and angels ascending and descending and Jacob called that place Bethel which means the house of God and so what Jesus is claiming here is that he is the new the true Bethel the house of God 
And if you go then and link this back to chapter 1, just a few verses earlier, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the new house of God. And then the final title that Jesus gives himself here is the Son of Man. And this one comes from Daniel 7 where we see one like the Son of Man being given universal authority. He can approach the Ancient of Days and his rule will never end. So that's specifically in verse 13 and 14. So adding to the picture, Son of Man and angels ascending and descending. So these titles are giving us a massive, massive view of who this Jesus is. Not only is he from the first 18 verses the Word uh, who was with God and was God and made all things, the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Those are incredible things, but John just keeps adding on the evidence, the testimony, what others said, what they heard and what they saw. And the picture just gets expanded in an incredible way. One of the key things that we need to take note of in this section is how people respond to this Jesus. This massive picture of Jesus calls for a response. The evidence calls for a response. And we see the disciples, we're told a number of times that they followed. Jesus said to them, come, and they followed. They followed Jesus. It says here, uh, they saw where he was staying and spent that day with Jesus. Spending a day with Jesus for Andrew and this other unnamed disciple changed their lives forever. There's a good chance that the unnamed disciple is the author of this gospel. John, the disciple himself, he, doesn't, he often doesn't name himself in the gospel. He speaks of himself as the disciple Jesus loved. Um, or the other disciple. And so by not mentioning his name here, he's probably uh, alluding to the fact that it actually was him. But we see these disciples coming, following Jesus. Jesus calls uh, Philip and saying, follow me. And it's very clear that Philip also follows. But then Philip goes and says to Nathaniel, come, see. So there's this constant call to others. As the disciples meet Jesus, uh, they, they are calling others to come and see too. And then in verse 50, Jesus says, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. So again, this is picking up on that idea of belief that is key in John's gospel. So the response to Jesus, the following and the belief and the calling others are some of the key responses that we see. You see, Simon says the first thing he did was to find his brother. Uh, Philip found Nathaniel and went and told him. Uh, John the Baptist had pointed out to his disciples, this is the one. So all of these responses to Jesus are not only for the individuals to follow and believe, but it's also finding others and telling them, we have found this one, this one who we've been waiting for. And as we look at this, it should challenge us to also be a people who, as we have a growing vision of who Jesus is, that we too are those who see that he is the only one worth following. These disciples, these two disciples, had been with John the Baptist as his disciples, but they left John to follow Jesus because they, they knew he was the one. Philip, we aren't told much of the backstory here. Jesus says, follow me. It's very clear that he does. He sees in Jesus someone worth following. He tells Nathaniel, come and see. It's worth coming. It's worth seeing. And then Jesus says, you will see greater things than that. They would see greater things just a couple of days later at a wedding in Canaan, which we'll see in chapter 2, where Jesus did the first of his signs, where he, he turned water into wine and many then believed. So we see this group of disciples, followers, followers of Jesus growing 
as the chapters continue, the evidence mounts and it calls for belief. This belief leads to life through Jesus. And we can see why we can have life through Jesus, because he is the promised one. He is the Lord, the Lamb of God, God's chosen one, the Messiah, the one Moses wrote about, the Son of God, the King of Israel, God with us, the Son of Man. And the most amazing thing that we see in verse 29 is that John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This one came into the world to save sinners so that we might have life. As we dig further into this passage, it should indeed thrill our hearts at the reality of who Jesus is. And I pray that it will encourage you and that it will stir you to be one who has a growing vision of Jesus, but also that all of us would be those who call others and say, come and see, come and see this Jesus. So God bless as you dig in further. And next time we'll be looking at the whole of chapter two of this great gospel. Thank you.